My name is Josh Hurry, and I am the communications coordinator here at the Saskatchewan SPCA. Uh, again, thank you for being here for this webinar series, which we've called Difficult Decisions When Navigating the Journey. Uh, I would like to begin by uh, recognizing the land where I am today, uh, which is where I live and work, uh, is located on Treaty 4 territory, which is the tra traditional lands of the Cree, uh, the Assiniboine, and the Soto, uh, and it's also the homeland of the Métis. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge that the Sask SPCA office uh, is in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory. That is where Bev, our guest, is today. Uh, and as a provincial organization, the Saskatchewan SPCA serves those who live in the areas covered by treaties 2, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, and of course the traditional homeland of the Métis. Uh, we as an organization acknowledge and pay our respects to the ancestors of this land. Uh, as I mentioned, we encourage you to take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, again, tell us about yourself, uh, where you work, uh, where you work rather and uh, what you hope to learn from today's webinar. Today's webinar, uh, I think most people are aware, is uh, around the topic of euthanasia. Uh, it is a sensitive topic, and we encourage you to uh, take the space that you need. If the conversation maybe is a little too difficult, please um, you know, feel free to uh, take your space and, and take some time to uh, take care of yourself. Um, most of us can conjure up an entertaining memory of an animal, whether livestock or companion. As caretakers, the animals in our lives leave a lasting impression in our hearts. And sadly, humans have a longer lifespan than most domesticated animals. Uh, and that means that we will one day have to say goodbye to our beloved pets. Uh, these end-of-life conversations are often avoided due to the raw emotions, uh, but that uh, and that can be difficult uh, to navigate when the time comes. Um, from unexpected losses in a herd to saying goodbye to a best friend, many considerations must be made, uh, and grief will often follow. Um, this webinar will illuminate the emotional topic of euthanasia. Uh, this is the first in a series of three, uh, and today's webinar will be slightly different from our usual format. If you have participated in a SASC SPCA webinar before, uh, often it's uh, a presentation from a speaker. And while we do have a speaker here today, uh, we are going to do more of a conversational style uh, presentation, and so I'm going to have uh, a fireside chat, if you will, uh, with Bev Ashwin from Family Pet Cremation Services and the Saskatoon Pet Loss Support Group. Uh, so Bev, welcome and thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, Josh. Happy to have you. Uh, Bev, why don't we get started with you uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and how you uh, got involved with this unique line of work. Well, thank you, Josh. I to start to start with. I was with the banking, banking, um, banking for thirty six years, and once I retired from banking, I was um, on retirement, and was asked if I would join Family Pet Cremation Services, which is uh, kind of quite quite different from banking. And then I was also involved with the Saskatoon Pet Loss Support Group. And um, having lost a pet, my first pet as, a, as an adult 26 years ago, Mocha, was a very, very dear uh, dog of mine. I was a volunteer with the Saskatoon Pet Loss Support Group. And losing a pet is the most heartbreaking, heartbreaking experience that I ever could have could have imagined. And I went into the Saskatoon Pet Loss Support Group just as a, as a member. And I volunteered a little bit with them. And once that group folded, I then started volunteering with that group when it was formed again in conjunction with the Edwards Family Center and Saskatoon Funeral Home. And I've now been facilitating the group for approximately 13 years with Family Pet Cremation Services. So for somebody who 
maybe has been recently in a situation where they have had to say goodbye to a pet, if they are looking for support uh, and they do find the support groups that you're facilitating, uh, what can they expect when they come to a meeting? Well, coming to a meeting, it's it's a safe space, Josh. Um, losing a pet as I said, is the most devastating part of having a pet. We don't we don't think about the last days of the life when we, we we get a pet. That's the last thing that that we think that we think about. Um, we th we think about the joyful times that we have with the pet. We think of the fun times that we have with the pet, whether it's a dog or a cat or a fish or a bird. When you have lost it. Sometimes you have absolutely nobody to talk to. Coming to a pet loss support group, there's people that have have perhaps been in the same situation as you have, and they understand. They understand that losing a pet is the, the same as losing a family member. And people will say, well, no, it's not, it's not the same as losing a family member. But to some people, it is perhaps they live alone, perhaps they have no family support. And if it was an elderly person or a person that lives alone, perhaps this was their only reason for getting up in the morning. And coming to a pet loss support group, they, their voice can be heard. Their loss is validated. Yeah, I certainly uh, can understand how some folks might feel a little hesitant because there are attitudes out there from individuals who just see this this pet as nothing more than an animal. But we all know, I mean, I think everybody here today uh, certainly understands the importance that an animal has in the lives of, of us. I, myself, uh, my family, we share our, our home with four animals. We have two cats and two dogs. And and, uh, you know, we have an older dog now who uh, is, um, you know, she's getting a little stiffer and, and moving a little bit slower. And, and we know that uh, we're going to be facing this decision uh, at some point in the next couple of years. And hopefully it's it's still a few years down the road. But these circumstances can change uh, very quickly. Um, what do you say, folks, or what do you say, Bev, to folks who um are having these discussions with their veterinary team right now um i don't think there's anything that can be said to make these conversations easier but how would you kind of offer support to somebody who is just beginning to have these conversations with their their veterinary team oh uh, that's a good yeah, very good um inquiry josh I do, because I work at the Family Pet Cremation Services, I do have that conversation with many people. They will call in just inquiring about our services and that their pet is not doing well and they're just starting to pre-plan and, and they say, well, pet is still wagging its tail, it's still eating a little bit. And so then I ask the question, if you're if you have if the pet has five wonderful things that it still can, that it likes to do, how many of those five things is it still enjoying doing? Look at the qual qual quality of life. Is the quality of life still there? But it still is between you and the and your pet. But I cannot still make the decision for the pet, but I still look at the quality of life. I've lost eight, unfortunately, I've lost eight dogs over the past 26 years. So I know how difficult it is. So I try, I sometimes will give, um, I will share some of my losses with these people so that they, they realize that I have been there, that I know how difficult it is a discussion of a decision that it is. But I also suggest to the to the person that's calling in that have a conversation with their vet veterinarian that the veterinarian would never ever 
um, steer them the wrong, wrong way, that uh, this is my opinion, of course, that they would never steer them the wrong way, that if there was anything that they could do, that they would. But if look at the quality of life. Yeah, I think that's important to remember for sure. Um, the support group, Bev, if we go back to your work in that area, uh, is this a program that is available just to the pet owners or is this something that, uh, you know, if somebody, um, you know, maybe maybe their friend's pet was very, they were, had a special relationship with a friend's pet, could they still come and and uh, meet with you and, and get support from the folks that uh, that come to these meetings? Uh, definitely, Josh. Anybody that feels they need support and the uh, loss of a pet or a friend's pet is bothering them or they are feeling badly about it, anybody is welcome to come and there's no charge. Um, we're there to support them. We're there to, to listen to them. And sometimes that's all that they need is to be heard that they just need to be heard. They need to have their their grief and sadness validated that it is just not a pet. Mm -hmm. uh, how do people sign up? Is there a registration list or can they just pop in if that's what they need to do? Yeah, there's no registration list. Um, they just have to pop in. We meet the first and third Sunday of every month at the family pet office on 33rd street. And, but if they just want a phone and need to have a conversation with me, they certainly can call also during the week. I'm there Monday to Friday. If they just need to have a, a talk, they can, but for the organized group, it is the first and third Sunday of every month. And if there's any changes at all, I do put it on the Facebook page. Okay. Uh, Bev, what uh, have you found to be the most impactful about offering a group setting uh, for those who've experienced the loss of a pet, uh, especially uh, disenfranchised grief? Disenfranchised grief, pe people that, um, and I did write a few things down, I'll just, it, uh, unva unvalidated grief, disenfranchised grief, people that feel that the the loss of a the loss of a pet is not real it's not valid they that's what they feel in their workplace with their friends with their family people don't believe that my loss of a pet is real and coming to a group they feel that their voice has been heard they're being understood that they're not crazy, that thank goodness somebody's finally listening to me. They understand that my fluffy or my spot or my rover or my little fish, they somebody understands. And I can talk about them without being judged. So the disenfranchised grief is so real and I just feel sorry for some people that only have human friends because animal friends are just just as important and sometimes more important for some people. I have talked to um, big, big, um, strong, tough guys that just melt when they talk about talk about their little chihuahua or their little cat that because they feel that they have to be strong in front of their buddies but when they come to to me or to a, a group setting they know it's a safe place to talk and disenfranchised grief is so very real and so very sad that the, that the public don't understand mm -hmm. yeah i feel like in a situation like this uh because people process grief differently uh from person to person uh do people, do you find people attend one meeting, two meetings? Do they come for years at a time? And I'm guessing it varies from, from person to person, but do you have regular guests that uh, come 
fairly consistently over a prolonged period of time? I do have people that may just come once and and that that's just fine. But then I do have people that have come for many, many meetings. And then I have people that will come not during the group meeting, but they will come during my hours mm -hmm. because they want a one-on-one -on -one talk with me. Yeah. And that's okay too. But people are well. And I've had people come back on the one-year anniversary of when their pet has has um, been euthanized or been taken from them um, because they just wanted to thank me for being there for them at the time of their loss. But people are welcome to come for as often as they want or as few times as they want. There's no obligation. Very important to note. Um, and actually, I just want to mention too to folks that are here, uh, we of course are taking questions. So if you have any questions uh, for Bev, uh, please pop them in the chat. Uh, there's also the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and if you check at the bottom of your screen, you can click the Q&A box and you can pop your questions in there and we can uh, get those questions to Bev as well uh, before the end of our session. Um, Bev, going back to situations where we've talked a bit about veterinary involvement with euthanasia, um, and oftentimes, uh, if you do have your pet euthanized at the vet clinic, uh, they are able to help, um, I guess, with caring for, for your pet's body after uh, the process has been completed. Um, what happens if somebody is at home and, you know, their, their pet passes at home, uh, maybe more from a natural causes situation? Uh are you able to help and provide guidance to folks in a situation like that? Definitely, definitely, Josh. That that happens all the time with uh, family pet cremation services. I get those calls on a daily basis where somebody's little cat or or bunny or hamster or dog passes away, and they will call me, um, very very distraught that their dog's passed away. And I mean, I give my sympathies, of course, and hear a little bit about their story. And then they will, um, I'll ask them, they, however they feel comfortable bringing their pet in, they will bring it into me to the office and on 33rd Street. And we like to have them there by a certain hour because then the pet is picked up and then taken out to the crematorium, which is on the Highway 11. I Swedesso, but they would they would bring the pet to me to on thirty third street, and we do a little bit of paperwork, and they can I can take a, cl a clip of hair for them, and they can say their say their goodbyes, and that's where I do a lot of my grief support is when they bring their pet into me. Yeah, I, I feel too like, um, and that maybe this is more a question for in the veterinary field, but maybe this is something that you can touch upon as well. Um, in the past, I've I've heard one of, you know, one of the reasons that somebody maybe chooses to not uh, go through with the euthanasia process is the costs that are involved. Um, and, you know, maybe finances are tight and so they can't quite um, you know, make that commitment. And, and so the, the pet, uh, is maybe in a situation where discomfort is, is, is experienced for longer than necessary. Um, and, and I'm wondering if you can speak to the cost of, of the services that you provide, is that something you're able to share a little bit about here as well? Oh, uh, I, I can, um, I don't have all the prices right in front of me, but for for, for example, for a if the pet was bought, brought directly um, to me for a small like for a small dog, let fifteen or fourteen pounds and under, it's one hundred and forty five dollars plus tax for a private cremation, and that includes an urn, and the urn is a metal urn. With uh, and the cream and the cremains are placed in a bag inside the urn, 
And it's approximately seven to 10 days in order to get the remains back. And then it goes, and then it's $170 $70 for up to 59 pounds, I believe. And then it goes up from there. Mm-hmm. And, and if I, it's a little, if it's a little hamster or a little like a, that kind of a pocket pet, then it's $78, including tax. That's good information to have. And I, I actually like that you've touched on the fact that we're not just talking about cats and dogs. Uh, you know, there are a variety of animals out there that that are special to people. And just because it's an animal that maybe you're not fond of doesn't mean it's not special to somebody else. Uh, thinking specifically about rodent Excellent. pets and uh, and maybe birds. Um, you've talked about fish as well. Um, snakes. I'm assuming, yes, snakes. So these are all animals that you see brought to Prairie or uh, to, to your Family office. Family pet, yes. yes. Uh, I actually just want to point out a comment here that uh, Autumn shared with everyone uh, where she talks about her experience with disenfranchised grief. Um, and, and Autumn says that she experienced it from her mother and stepfather following the death of, of their dog uh, in August uh, of this year. So very recently, uh, she received amazing support from friends and colleagues uh, throughout the journey, but was never checked on. Uh, or even provided a text call or sympathy from from parents, despite them knowing how much the animal meant meant to Autumn. Um, and uh, yeah, she goes on to say, I consistently refer to my dogs as my children slash fur babies, and the lack of my parents' acknowledgement of my bond relationship and love for Navi was heartbreaking. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, so many people that I know have these special bonds with their animals, and so uh, is is that something that you hear regularly too uh, is is maybe uh, individuals get support from one uh, group in their lives, but maybe not from other groups? Absolutely, Josh, I hear that all, all the time. I hear it all the time that they'll get it. And often it could even be from a partner. They may not get it from the partner, but they may get it from their parents. They may get it from the parents and not from their par- partner or their coworkers. And they may find um, their best support may be from a cashier in a grocery store. That they're taught that all of a sudden they break down in a grocery store and the gross- and the clerk will say, oh, I just lost my dog yesterday. I'm so glad we had that conversation. You just never know, like with disenfranchised grief, you just never know who your best support will be. And and that's the reason it's so important to to, um, say something. And I'm so sad for Autumn with her comment that she did not get the support that she needed from her parents. They they did not get it. They didn't understand how important her her dog was to her, her and her family. Yeah, it uh, it's an unfortunate situation, and uh, hopefully, a conversation like this will uh, shed some light uh, and put things into a different perspective for people to realize that, as the title of your presentation says, it's not just a dog or a cat or a hamster, right? It is, uh, it is a very special being to many individuals, um, and that's important that's- to recognize. Absolutely, Josh. I've um, spoke to um, se- like se- seniors where they just lost their dog or their cat, and it's so very sad for them too, because it was the last connection to perhaps their deceased wife or husband, mm-hmm. and so it's even sadder. And their family doesn't understand. Well, it's just a dog, but no, but that was my wife's dog. Yeah. No, I can certainly appreciate that. I just think about some dynamics in my own family uh, where I have an aunt who very much, she will openly admit that her her dog is, uh, you know, keeps her active. They get out for walks and everything like that. And and some other folks in our family don't see the point. But it, no. I mean, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but it is a reality. Uh, but hopefully we can change those perceptions. For um, sure. 
a question has come in here, Bev. So we've talked a lot about the work that you do in Saskatoon. And so this question is, uh, is there a group similar to yours uh, that you're aware of, at least, Bev, in, in Brandon, Manitoba, or I guess, uh, you know, in, in other parts of even Saskatchewan? Uh, unfor unfortunately, as far as I know, there isn't. I had started a group also in Regina uh, several years ago. I went down to I went down to Regina and started a group in Regina, and it was um, facilitated by volunteers for a few years, and it folded because of lot, lack of volunteers. I'm trying to get it started up again with volunteers, but there that's part of the problem is getting volunteers. I do facilitate the Regina Facebook uh, Facebook Pet Loss Support Group and facilitate the Facebook page for the Saskatoon Pet Loss Support Group. I do not know if there's one in Brandon. I do not think there is. There used to be one in Calgary. There no longer is one in Calgary even. So I can look into it for Brandon though, and I can, if there is one, I can put it on the Saskatchewan SPCA page, but I can look into it for that, for that caller. Sure. And and I guess, Bev, kind of further to that, if you talked about volunteers, so if there is somebody who's here today who uh, is in a community where the service is not currently available, if they were interested in maybe uh, starting a support group in their local community, is that something they could reach out to you uh, for some guidance and support? Definitely. Definitely. If it's something that you feel is needed and i think it is needed in every community then definitely reach out send a message through to the to the saskatoon pet loss support page just send it i'm the only one that sees the messages so send a message through to me and i can uh, see see what i can do for you and that's on facebook right it's just that's on uh, facebook yes okay uh a couple of other questions here bev so You've talked a little bit about having lost eight pets of your own. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience with animal-related grief? Absolutely. And I do sometimes with the, it depends on how many people are at the group or if there's people that have been there before, I will share some of my um, stories because people want to know that I have had experience with grief so that I know what I'm talking about as well. And my first experience with grief as an adult was 26 years ago when I lost Mocha, who was, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, who was a little peekapoo. And she was 14 years old when I lost her and she passed away of kidney disease. And, and I thought it was going to be the, the death of me because it was so very devastating. I didn't know that there could be anything so horrid as that. But, and I was off work for three weeks. The, I have lost eight, six, six of which I had to make the decision to have them euthanized. Moth at Mocha, I did have to make the decision. One of, one of my eight passed away from a heart attack right in front of me and I will never ever forget the bl blood curdling scream when she um, died of a heart attack in my home and I'll try to get through this um three years tomorrow was when I lost Annie when a large dog picked her up and killed her I was out. I was out walking in my yard, out walking in my neighborhood. A large stray dog ran across the street and picked up Annie and instantly killed her. And that's three years tomorrow. I'm sorry, Bev, that uh, I can't imagine what that would feel like. And uh, I hope that you were able to find supports to help you 
in that situation in all situations because it's definitely not easy no no that's uh sorry that's uh a loss that i have not got over yeah it um it's unfortunate that sometimes we're in those situations where there's a an animal at large that that could be dangerous and and cause clearly uh you know a lot of a lot of grief and um and just not not do anything that is um i, I guess it's just an unfortunate situation i uh, like i said i can't can't imagine what that would feel like and i'm kind of at a lot of loss of words right now and and it uh yeah, I feel for you, Bev. It really is a sad situation. My condolences to you. Uh, thank you. Well, and another thing with Annie, she was, um, a lot of people will know her that came into my office as she was a therapy dog. She was a therapy dog for my clients. So a lot of people um, would know her. She had a um, wardrobe of over 150 custom-made dresses. She had been a rescue. And so this is where I might share, uh, other people may share. She had been a rescue at nine, nine years of age, but she had been dumped. And at nine years of age, she was rescued from a, a, a rescue. And so she came, came into my life and she was an instant, instant um, therapy dog in my office. And I lost her three years later to a uh, irresponsible pet, irresponsible pet owner that I never did get any satisfaction. They they never did express any remorse. And oh, she and she and and she 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 she, she supplied support to all of my clients. I hope there's some comfort that you're able to garner knowing that she was, she meant a lot to so many people. It doesn't make the loss easier, but I hope that there's a sense of comfort in that. Oh, there, there is Josh. It took me. So when people um, say it's just a dog or it's just a cat, they just don't always, they just don't get it. Mm-hmm because they haven't experienced the grief that myself or so many of my clients um, have experienced because I have lived this same kind of experience that so many people that have walked in my door have. Yeah. And, and it's interesting with pets that people are so quick to, uh, you know, write it off as just being an animal and, and you wouldn't hear, I've, in my involvement here with the Task SPCA, I've heard countless stories of individuals who have said, you know, the pet, this pet is my reason for living. They're the reason that I'm fighting to get out of the hospital or they're the reason that I wake up and, and they keep me going. And uh, to just try and just slough it off is, it's not important, is so unfair. Um and I, I don't think you would take that approach to somebody who is, you know, grieving the loss of a, a human loved one. Uh, you know, you would offer as much support to, as possible, I think. And so hopefully we get to a point where animals are viewed in the same light, uh, because to many people, they're just as important and, and maybe even more so uh, than a human companion. Oh, I, he I hear that often, Josh. I hear people come in after they've lost their their pet and they they said it's sometimes it sounds silly but I feel more sad than when I've lost my parent or my brother or my grandmother but they maybe were looking after their pet 24 hours and maybe they didn't see their parent often or their sibling but they they were looking after their pet all the time so, of course, they're going to feel that much more sad when they've lost their pet. And it's it's real. 
And when you've lost a, a pet or a companion animal, it absolutely, as I, as I say to people that walk in the door, it sucks. Yeah. yeah. It absolutely sucks. Yeah, absolutely does. Uh, Bev, I'm not sure if you're seeing the comments in uh, the chat here, but I just want you to know that uh, there are many uh, words of support uh, and condolences going out to you. Uh, so please know that uh, people are supporting you here as well. Um, and there's a comment here. Uh, I, I think this touches upon irresponsible pet ownership and, and somebody here, Deborah shared a comment about watching a pit bull. Uh, and I don't want to make it seem like we're piling on pit bulls, but no. the, this, this is mentioned here um, that a, a pit bull raced over and tear uh, their dog's throat. Fortunately, this dog was, was uh, survived the incident, uh, but this has left Deborah uh, being terrified of stray dogs. And that's something that I can relate to because I had a similar situation uh, with uh, a dog where I was walking through my neighborhood and and it was Christmas morning and I remember getting ready to leave for my aunt's house for Christmas and I thought I would take the dog for a quick uh, walk around the block because believe it or not the dog wasn't welcome at Christmas dinner but that's okay <laughs> yeah, um, right and um, took the dog for a quick walk and a neighbor had uh, a large dog that when they opened the door, because they were loading their vehicle for Christmas as well, I'm guessing they were going somewhere. But when they opened their screen door, their dog made a beeline out of the house and came after us. And I remember screaming for this person to to try and get their dog under control. But there was no sense of urgency from that person at all. And I just remember being so frustrated that I'm trying to keep myself between me and this dog uh, or my dog and this 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 dog that's now at large, and uh, and just to see the nonchalant uh, way the person handled the situation and came over and eventually did, um, you know, uh, handle the dog and 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 take their dog away. But uh, yeah, that was a call that I had to make to animal control to because uh, I mean there were lots of kids that lived on my street and I'm just happy that I didn't have my son with me. Uh, that morning too because who knows what could have happened in that situation so definitely a slightly different topic from yeah um, bereavement but again I think it's just important to recognize that uh, it's important to be a responsible pet owner because bad things can happen bad things can happen definitely yeah, yeah I know a lot of people may not want to Think of their dog as being aggressive, but I always think of the comment that any dog can bite and and circumstances might see your dog behave in a way that you don't often or might not traditionally see, right? So just keep that in mind, I think. Yes, because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I also want to acknowledge a comment here coming in from Cindy, uh, who says, uh, my family doesn't understand uh, the words they used when my two Shih Tzus died were harsh. Quote, just get over it. Stop crying. Uh, unquote. I struggle with guilt for loving my two buddies so much. I'm retired. They were my life. My father died years ago and I grieved, but loss of my companions is more difficult as they were with me every day. Uh, Cindy, I'm sorry that you didn't get the support that uh, would have been helpful in your situation. And uh yeah, it's not easy. Bev, do you have any comments for Cindy? Uh, I'm so sad for your your loss, Cindy, and that you didn't have the support that you did. And you certainly can call or still message me if you're still feeling, um, if you're still grieving the loss of your Shih Tzus. And I do not discount your guilt, but, um, and I... I still have pangs of guilt also where everybody's going to have guilt. I don't discount them. Um, we have to try to get over the guilt because we don't, we shouldn't have any guilt feelings, but we, we will, we will, we will all have guilt feelings, but we have nothing to feel guilty about because we did all that we could 
even in my sits even in my situation with the tragic loss of my my Annie, I am um, I said, well, why did I take her out for a walk at that moment? If I hadn't have taken her out at the mo- moment, maybe this she wouldn't have got killed. But it still it wasn't my fault. And what ha- whatever happened with your Shih Tzu's, um, Cindy, whether it's one day too soon or one day too late, we're not guilty of anything except loving them as much as we, we can. Mm-hmm. Very, very true, Bev. Uh, kind of staying on that topic, Bev, what do you say to those folks who have maybe lost a pet but and, and are reluctant to welcome another animal into their life? Is that something you hear regularly too? I hear that often, and and pe- and people will say that all the time. I'm never going to get another pet. I'm never going to get another one because it's just too hard. I can't go through this again. I can't go through this sadness again. And I understand. I understand. It is hard. It is hard because I mean they've maybe had their pet for 15 16 years or even had a short time and it was a tra- and it was a tragic loss and maybe they want to travel or they want to do this or they want to do that but they they have so much love in their heart for another pet why not perhaps they could foster for a bit or they could volunteer at a shelter or if they're not sure, they could still, um, or they could dog sit or cat sit or bird sit or whatever type of pet that they had. Don't give up if you still love a pet because it's too hard. I, yes, I have lost eight pets and I think of all of them every day. I have three, I have three dogs now. Um, and I will never be out be without a dog because I need to have them in my life. I need to have them in my life because I love them too much. I need I need to have I need to be able to look after them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's uh, no doubt about it that an animal means different things to different people, but it's all equally important, I think, to recognize that. Uh, you know, the the love and support that you find from your animals might look a little bit different from the love and support that I find from mine. But, you know, it's that's it, it's love and support is what it is. And, and we we need to recognize that. And I think a lot of people do. But unfortunately, some people might not. And um, and some people are reluctant to open their lives because, you know, they don't want to go through the the trauma again of losing that beloved pet. Oh, and I have had some people, they will go out the very next day and get a pet because they're just so heartbroken. They cannot be go into their house another day without having a pet. And that's okay, too. Mm-hmm. Everybody's yeah. different. Exactly. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, Bev, I want to talk a little bit more. And, and I guess before we move on, just a reminder to folks, like you can still pop your questions and comments in the chat and uh, and we will get... Uh, those to Bev before the end of the hour. Um, But Bev, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, what happens um, to an animal if the owner passes away uh, unexpectedly. So uh, I'm wondering if you have any advice on what pet owners should do to prepare uh, in the event that they pass away before their pet. And that's a very good, good Valid question, Josh. And I have people ask me about that too. And and on also the other other side. Um is if aren't we lucky that our that our pets don't have to that that um we we don't pass away before our pets because the pets would be so confused. That's one thing I always say that because they always say, or I used to say, I wish that I would go first, 
But then on the other hand, my pet wouldn't know what, what, where I was. They would wonder wh where I was. But with make sure you have something written down in your will. If you have a will, make sure you you get get a will if you if you don't have one. Put something in your will. Pets cannot be, be beneficiaries. You can't. It's not not like in the movies where you can name name F F Fluffy to get get all your money. You can't do that in Canada. So, but make sure you have something written down that Fluffy or Spot is being looked after by somebody and make sure that your family knows who that person is and make sure that person is willing to take, to, to, to look after that, per look after your pet. Don't assume that the rescues are going to take your pets. The rescues are full. The SPCA is full. I have seen and heard too many stories where people assume that the rescues are going to take their pet. They're not. And I've had firsthand people where they've had family members pass away and they didn't even realize their loved one had pets. And then they didn't know what to do with them. And the pets are left abandoned or had to be euthanized. So put something in place for the for your pet and do it quickly. And if you don't have a will, at least put something, even put a note on your fridge, put something in in writing who is going to be looking after your pet and even have a trust in place with a little bit of money to look after your pet. Just make sure there's something in writing of who's going to look after your pet. That's good advice. That's good advice. I, I don't, uh, I've actually mainly because of, of the nature of my work have, uh, read articles about this very topic. Uh, but the one thing that wasn't touched upon, at least not that I can recall is the money side of it. And I think that's a good piece of advice too, is that, uh, there are obviously, uh, costs related to caring for a pet. So if you're able to, um, provide a little bit of, of money to the individual who is taking on uh, the duties and responsibilities of caring for your pet. I think that would be a big help for lots of individuals. Well, another thing, somebody also, that when a person passes away, what's going to happen to the cremains of your pets? If you want, if your pets are in urns, if you want them to go with you, make sure that's recorded also and that your family knows I want the urns of the cremated remains of my pets to go with you when you pass away. Uh, we actually have another comment that comes in and this is from Cindy who shared the story about her, her two Shih Tzus earlier um, and, and kind of touches back on the side of, of, of grieving, but welcoming another animal into your life. And Cindy says uh, she still has tons of love to give. She's still grieving Jake, who uh, she lost in March of 23, and Molly in July of 24. Uh, but she's adopted two puppies that should arrive in a week. And uh, she honestly thinks Molly and Jake would be happy. Uh, and these two uh, are not replacing Molly and Jake, but they're, they're new members of the family nonetheless, I think is important to note there. Uh, so, Cindy, thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, we all know that you have many years of uh, happy memories to make with your new puppies once they come home. That's fabulous there. They'll just be filling the void. Yep. Uh, and then we have uh, a comment here, uh, a question, I guess. Uh, it says, my former vet, uh, who was the president of the Provincial Vets Association where I live, uh, once told me that euthanasia doesn't have to be done, but rather palliative care until the end, if a person can handle it. Uh, can it be appropriate as long as the pet isn't suffering? Do you have any insight or comments on that, Bev? Oh, well, certainly. Um, ab absolutely. If a person can, can look after your pet in pal in palliative care, absolutely do that. If you're able to do that and you're financially able to do that, um, do it. Um, I did that with my with Mocha um, for the last six months 
of her life, I was able financially, thank goodness, to, to be able to look after. She was in kidney failure, and I had to bathe her nightly, every night. And and so that was dr draining and exhausting, but that's what I did for her. And many of, and, and if you're able to do that, of course, lo long as your pet is still able to eat and long as your vet is on board with you, absolutely. If you can provide palliative care, go for it. All right, Bev, we are nearing the end of our hour. Uh, so I will just put out a reminder to folks uh, in the closing minutes here. Please feel free to pop in uh, any questions or comments that you may have. Um, uh, Bev, uh, any final thoughts that you want to share with folks that are here today? Uh, I appreciate all the people that have have um, entered into this conversation and hopefully you know how important your pets are in your life. And I just wanted to, I did put a couple of notes down and um, regarding tragic loss too, that sometimes people will say comments that aren't always correct and you have to take them with a grain of salt. So don't say that every don't say everything happens for a reason because some things are random and are devastating. And your pets wouldn't want you, don't say your pets wouldn't want you to be sad because they would completely understand why you're heartbroken and would feel the exact same thing if you were gone. And you just need to, don't say you just need to focus on the positive. Find the people and and find the people and places that don't want to make you feel like you want to hide and remind you that it's okay to feel the way you are. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to be sad. Mm -hmm. And never say they're in a better place because the best place is always with you. Yes, that, um, yeah, that I think is a nice way to, to leave things, Bev. Um, yeah, they're, they're, go they're gone and it's so unfair. Yeah. Often it's unfair that they're gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I do have, uh, so Autumn uh, has left a comment, uh, going back to the idea of a trust and, and the wills, um, and and Autumn has some suggestions here too that that uh, I think would work well if you don't have a will. Uh, as Autumn says, my husband and I do not yet have a will, but we do have advanced care plans and included in our notes who the medical social worker should contact in the event both my husband and I cannot speak for ourselves. For example, uh, a car accident, intubated, etc. Uh, our neighbors and close friends, including the people listed on our advanced care directive, have keys to our home. Uh, and this provides Autumn and her husband with some assurance that their dogs will be taken care of in the event that uh, they're unable to care for the animals because of medical reasons. So I think those are some great tips, too, that folks can take away from this session. Yes, definitely. Uh, so thank you so much to everybody. Bev, thank you for sharing not only your knowledge and expertise, but really kind of sharing uh, your emotions with us because this is not an easy topic and it is a difficult conversation to have. And uh, I, I think the fact that, you know, we have a group of folks here who uh, have taken a bit of their day to come and, and listen to uh, this conversation uh, shows that it is a topic that uh, many people, uh, you know, might think of and a situation Unfortunately, that many people uh, are, you know, may have to face unexpectedly. Uh, I mentioned to you, Bev, earlier how one of my best friends right now is uh, this week is is the week that they're going to have to say goodbye to to their dog that they've had for, um, well, I, I his the dog started off as his wife's dog, and he 
uh, welcome the dog into his life and they've been together now for six or seven years so and and so his wife uh, I think the dog they said is about 14 so that just goes to show you know how long an animal can be in a person's life and then the fact that you're one day gonna have to say goodbye is no easy uh, thing to deal with but it is an unfortunate reality that we have to face as pet owners.